Thank you, Margaret, very much. I'm very happy and honored to be speaking today at WIDS uh, Stanford. Um, as my title says, uh, I'm going to go over, holistically speaking, several issues facing data science researchers in places that I would call data deserts. So for some of you who don't know, I come from Beirut, Lebanon, which is a country that has seen and continues to see one war after the other. Uh, but at the same time, we have to do what we have to do. And so um, uh, this talk will uh, go over a couple of projects in that regard. A little bit about me, I have a training in pure mathematics. Uh, my former research area was in parallel cache oblivious algorithms and data structures com computer algebra. That was a field where you could hardly see any women working, let alone shining, and so with time I got alienated, but I decided that if I were to do the shift, it's going to be to a field where I could tackle problems that speak about people and do stuff for people. And that for me was data science for the public good with emphasis on tackling problems pertinent to our region. Uh, this also is in a bit to reconcile my professional and personal experiences. So I was born and lived during the Lebanese Civil War, and I originally um, was born with a refugee status. So I also had this in me, so what it can um, sort of form a refugee do for refugees? What can I, how can I bring my knowledge to the service of this community? The relevant questions of interest were at the lowest levels of the hierarchy of our needs, beginning with the burden of war and displacement, well, perhaps a bit higher with regards to misinformation that fuels tension and conflict amongst locals, misinformation that could mean life and death for some people. Uh, discrimination against the refugee communities is also something that is always on my mind. How can we possibly um, just, uh, test the data around us and analyze it to, to detect any trends in that? In summary, how to describe the perpetual state of wars that we live in. Uh, but of course, reality hits and we realize we're working in a data desert where all the, the three, four Vs of data are compromised. Uh, we talk about problems with volume and velocity. This is not so big data. We have logistical and financial hurdles against the ability to collect data. And when we do, it has low temporal or spatial resolution. It's not too frequent, maybe here, maybe there. Uh, veracity also has, we have issues with low quality data that is being generated around poor relevance sometimes. Um, and only a few people organizations collect data which might influence the spread. The variety also also is of concern for us researchers as we are faced with the fact that it's only very traditional sources of data that we can have access to. Um, and social media, for example, which is providing a very rich reservoir for data nowadays for analysts, social analysts, for us may not be really too uh, favorable. Where significantly less people possess an outspoken presence online because of the perception that existing political apparatus is conceived to be intolerant of free speech. Uh, I would add to the four Vs the extra uh, attribute of monopoly, where because of security concerns in the war against terror, for example, if you wish to have access to mobile phone records, the immediate answer would be no, we can't do that. This is a high security country. We can't give you access to this and that. And also the data ownership complex, uh, which is sort of around socioeconomic data collected by humanitarian and international agencies and private sector, which just because they're collecting the data, they sort of maintain monopoly over who to give it to. Um, data, well, in the couple of coming slides, I would discuss maybe some possible detours that I had to go through together with my team just to show people that there is a way to break all that. Um, and for us, it was turning to data sources at the grassroots level. For example, volunteers where we explore databases set up and maintained by social activists, volunteers in the region. And our example is going to be the Violation Documentation Center, which I'll refer to as we speak. Um, also, in the absence of governmental support, you resort to connections, personal connections, contact that can help mediate between you and the government sort of channels and a maze that can get you there. And for us, that was uh, an example through the Ministry of Health Public, uh, Public Health uh, project. You could apply to funds and competitions that 
promise that if you sort of, if your proposal makes it, we'll give you data. And for us, it was through Turk Telecom. Uh, being in a university also opens up opportunities to speak to colleagues in other disciplines. And I would really recommend for young data scientists to actively seek to present themselves to collaborate with colleagues in other disciplines who collect data routinely. For example, um, in our case, it was agriculture, public health and medicine. Uh, we'd come up and say, we have AI machine learning expertise and we can help you. But also we have an advantage because we're an academic institution that promotes open data initiatives uh, such as the AUB. We were able to tap into archives of, of the university, say for News Corpora, and try to analyze you know, the, the material there. Uh, the detours are not just at the level of data. I would also say that just because we work in this data desert means we have to put in an extra effort into tapping into some of the very advanced machine learning techniques and not just do with the available uh, technologies, let's say through O2ML or the like. Um, the, the techniques I'm going to name, um, I've selected because they really help in, the, in our context of small and not so big, not so good data. A few short learning for not so big data, for example, meta learning is one of them. Imbalanced learning techniques where there's a terrible, notorious skew with respect to the minority classes. I would name utility based regression, cost cost sensitive classification uh, as well. Uh, but also, I cannot stress enough the importance of probabilistic forecasting that accounts for uncertainty in the data, for example, um, extensity neural networks, and needless to say, inter interpretability. The user is here, they already do not trust AI or, or ML on their data, and you have to put in an effort to interpret your results. Um, uh, the three case studies that are most favorite to me are the automatic fake news detection in the Syrian conflict, analyzing Syrian refugee mobility in Turkey using Turk telecom data, and predicting primary healthcare demand by Syrian refugees. Now, the main question around these is, are these data-driven processes impacted by peaks in the Syrian war? Can we analyze all of the above using facts from the Syrian war? And of course, other ancillary data as applicable. Now, the in context, in hindsight, there has to be ground truth around us as we speak. So we want to look at things in time and space. And for us, with regards to the war, uh, we were interested to keep track of events with a heavy cost in civilian lives, or maybe events with non-conventional weapon reuse, uh, ethnic cleansing that has really a huge physical and psychological impact, and also keep track of attacks by major perpetrators, players in the war, not necessarily impact in terms of human sort of burden of, of casualties, but also sort of psychological, who's doing what. Um, and then for us, the, the guiding the guiding repository, as, and I was happy to see that a, a lot of researchers who've spoken on in, on, in WIS as well have alluded to this um, di documentation center is the Syrian VDC, an NGO registered in Switzerland that tracks human rights violations through uh, field reporters. So reports uh, submitted by volunteers um, and the data there is really individualized. So each record in the VDC just tracks an individual, their cause of death, gender, age group, the perpetrator, place of death and date of death. But of course, from these individual records, we need to get, to get to a stage where we see the full picture. And for us, we had to aggregate all this data to understand the sort of peaks in the Syrian war. We've, of course, had to resolve discrepancies between Arabic and English, but eventually got to a stage where we had a sort of a representation of what the peaks in the Syrian war happened to be. Now, for fake news detection, of course, we had to scrape articles around these peaks from a variety of sources, libertarian mobilization social responsibility, etc. And we had to extract the relevant information from these articles that could be mapped to the Violation Documentation Center. Articles that did not really adhere to this were, were simply discarded. Now, the extraction was happened on multiple levels. We crowdsourced, we asked people to manually allentate, um, but we also, in an offshoot project, perform automatic sequence tagging and developed the sort of um, uh, sequence stack data set that's available for researchers to look into and, and see what kind of information is automatically uh, extracted. For each scraped article, we extracted the information that is relevant to the VDC, particularly with respect to the number of civilians, children and women, the act and cause of death. And so we had two vectors, one from the VDC representing ground truth and another one representing the article and what it says with respect to these dimensions. Uh, we 
ended up with 804 data articles that were sort of um, that, that could be mapped to the VDC. We clustered them um, into two, two, two categories. And the result, as you see, um, showed us a sort of a highly uh, convincing uh, stratification between the two groups saying the closer a centroid is to the VDC, we'd label these as true, and the further away the centroid is from the VDC, we'll label it as, as false. Uh, other, uh, of course, taking it further, this data set is to be used for machine learning classification. And what we're currently doing is elaborating on new features re regarding sectarian language and inconsistency score with regards to ground truth and try to sort of meta learn through this because this is a small data set and researchers would ask, is this really something that you think will generalize? Uh, our results at this point in time are around 90% of accuracy, significantly beating baseline models. Um, the Syrian refugee mobility analysis through Turk Telecom, we had um, a, a guiding question like, are mobility measures influenced by the large scale events happening in Syria? We're talking about entropy, which is a measure of randomness, trying to deflect uh, increasing ability of a population to acclimate to its surroundings, or the radius of gyration, which, which really tells us, are people able to contact um, individuals further away from their center of mass? Uh, we aggregated the Turk Telecom data with respect to the with respect to, to the VDC large-scale events, and we observed that entropy for refugees is always higher than entropy of citizens and the radius of gyration has higher variance among refugees than others. Uh, what are we going to infer from this? The intuition is that, temporally speaking, a large number of peak events are tracked from the BDC during those weeks when corresponding peaks in entropy and variance in radii of gyration are observed. Uh, and all of the observed peaks that take, take place at a time when the large scale events tracked are at an extremely close average proximity to the cities of the given socioeconomic indices group. Uh, the intuitive in inferences are increased group anxiety, perhaps leads to desire to maximize information sharing and acquisition. When the impact of large scale events decreases, enough information would have been shared among the refugee community by which mobility metrics begin to go down. Uh, our third uh, project is to forecast the demand or needs by part from the part of Syrian refugees onto healthcare systems. Also in the same spirit, can we link in space and time the increase in demand onto you know, the large scale events happening in Syria. The methodology here had to be extremely intricate. Um, a policy maker is not, we're just interested in predicting the actual demand. They're actually interested in predicting the peaks. When should they be better prepared? And because the data did not show too much of it, we had to resort to utility-based regression with the analog of, of, of sort of um, cost sensitive learning classif classification. Um, our results are that there have been temporal and uh, Association speak track from the BDC where indeed associated with peaks in demand. Our models were able to predict or track these sort of rare uh, high demand instances in the, in the data set. Spatial analysis, the decreasing distance to primary healthcare center was associated with increasing peaks in demand, meaning this is where refugees are flocking to. This is closer to Syria to where this event is happening and we'd expect higher demand. Our R squared through meta learning has actually beat the other sort of vanilla models significantly as, as, as appears here on the slide. So we were sort of happy that with such a very uh, delicate small data set we were able to 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 do well um other projects in progress just to sort of wrap up because this is how we started and we ended up opening to colleagues in the in the university but always in the spirit of public good we have an ongoing project funded by google ai impact challenge to try and use advanced probabilistic and pointwise machine learning to predict evapotranspiration and here again the int the intent is the farmer who's our client needs not just to know how much to water on regular days they want to know how much to water on extremely hot days that happen to be rare during the year and can we actually contend that data has a lot of uncertainty and account for uh, you know, uncertainty quantification in the whole process. Uh, also predicting birth defects using air pollution and medical history data from the Lebanese National Birth Registry data using extremely sparse ambient air pollution data collected from monitoring stations Lebanon courtesy of St. Joseph University. Uh, 
um, a very also uh, uh, dear pro a project that is dear to my heart would be to I mean, we, we've we've explored the archives of three leading Lebanese newspapers in in, uh, in Lebanon already. We've 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 OCR'd it using Tesseract for after tweaking the tool to to Arabic. Uh, this work is already published, and the word embedding that have been trained already appear for the public to use. Uh, but our 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 guiding question is going to be: Can we study temporal trends of bias against refugees uh, and stance with respect to regional conflicts that are really countless across various junctures in our history. I want to thank you all um, for listening so far and a big shout out to my wonderful female research assistants and students who who bore the biggest bulk of this work, Yasmin, Ra'a, Hiyam, and um, uh, Elham. And I'm sorry, Sara, of course. <laughs> thank you very much.